you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Sophie Barrington at Archer Creative are the experts in equine marketing and Sophie understands how to achieve success in the horse industry, providing innovative and outcome-driven marketing services that result in a dramatic difference to your bottom line. Go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington or search for Archer Creative and on those pages you'll find her contact details at the end. Now today we've got a regular guest coming back, Ben Netterfield. Now Ben has come, he's talked to us the first time. He's been pretty popular because he's got a couple of Listener's Choice episodes there and the Listener's Choice episodes are only our most popular ones and we take them and, and do put them on about 12 months later for people to listen to. So Ben's talked to us a bit before about mindset and um, you can correct me in a minute if I'm wrong, Ben, but it was it was micro stress. Just tell me a little bit. Oh, sorry. How, hi, Ben. How Lovely. are you? <laughs> hey, you, Lewis. How are good, you? Good. That's okay. Now, look, I know we're going to talk about more of a technical side today from your World Cup show jumping background, but you're also a, a mindset coach or a coach dealing a little bit in performance anxiety and things. So can we just in one or two sentences talk about what you do as a, you know, because you've sort of got two different phases of your coaching. Some people go off and specialise in jumping. Others go and specialise in, you know, helping people with their performance anxiety. But you do a bit of both, don't you? And today we're going to specialise a bit more on the show jumping. So do you want to just give us a quick rundown on your background? Um, yes, my background is uh, mostly as a show jumping coach and then, uh, more in recent times, I've gone into leadership coaching and dealing with also people's fears and anxieties and trauma. Yep. And also then obviously then how that relates into not just performance, but, you know, just trying to get the most out of any writing experience that you're just looking to, you know, go beyond those beliefs and, and anxieties that have happened throughout your life. Mm, mm. Okay. Well, that's, that's really good. Today we're going to talk about how to take on the challenge of coaching jump training. Is there any reason that you've picked this particular subject, Ben? Um, the main reason is, like, so I do a little bit of parent club coaching and you often see either parents or people that are that are quite keen as su- like supporters or wanting to help their kids mm-hmm. and they're just not quite sure what's the best way of, of going because, you know, to them it's, looks like this the most foreign, you know, voodoo magical system that we sometimes go to that, you know, how how where do you start? Where can you possibly get a foot in? Where can you make helpful advice? Um yep. where can you because you often see where a parent will grab onto one thing, then okay, that's my topic and then they, you know, go ahead and, and encourage the child with that and encourage the child with that and encourage the child with that for the next you know three months Mm -hmm. and the child's pretty much sick of that by that stage (laughs) um so it's just it's just getting to understand that bigger basic broader picture um the concept of of jumping yep all right now the first point we're going to talk about is the engine room of jumping so would you like to introduce those those basics um so the engine room of jumping comes back and this is what basically makes jumping work is the rider's position mm-hmm. um, and that that allows them to be secure and independently balanced. Uh, the rhythm and tempo, which we're talking about the horse, and then the line. And that the line we're talking about, um, the approach to the fence and also importantly away from the fence, which a lot of people forget. They, they're quite relieved to get over the fence and then forget <laughs> where they're going. Yes. Um, so that – and when you have that concept as as the – that's the engine room of all things jumping. That's also where most problems come from. So you can often get a what seems a very complicated problem down to a very simple, let's change one of those three things. Yep. And that usually helps enormously with any of those things. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that, that securing, particularly for the rider, that securing of their, when they're first starting out, securing their 
the independent balance is probably one of the biggest things that you work on. Okay, and that's the position. And then you've got the rhythm, yes. the tempo, and the line. Now, the next yep. thing you've got, and I know that this is difficult when people are first learning, you know, jumping, teaching jumping, because they just put jumps up and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But you want to talk a little bit about learning the distances and laying out exercises. So distances are probably one of the things that's very hard when you first, um, you know, talking about um, coaching in any form of, of jumping is there's so many variables and we'll look at that also in tied that next subject into this as well. Because you've got slope, surface, um, you know, group sizing, individual different horses, um, if you're not confident with at least the basic form of distance that you're using, that's at least one variable you're taking out of it. Whereas if you're you're not sure how to use the distances themselves, then you're already second guessing everything that's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you can set up a distance that you go, okay, I know this works in this situation, I need to then either slightly change the distance because you can still slightly change the distance or I've got to understand what's happening with the, the horse and or rider combination. And most of the time when you have that confidence that the, the distance is set fairly correctly, then I can more look to the horse and rider combination, what's happening with those two things. So the more you have that understanding, the easier that becomes. So once you're working on the basic concept that a, a good show jumping canter is 3.6 metres mm -hmm. um, in length. Yep. Um, and there's wonderful, like the, the best thing at the moment is there's so many wonderful books that have different grids, different um, poles, and lots of, lots and lots and lots of exercise that you can that you can start with. And the the big thing with that is you can start in a very simple, very simple way. And realistically, you can start literally with one pole on the ground. And you can work on those things which we talked about as the engine room right from there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, say, the balance, we can have a rider walking in. Where are they looking? Are they even in the saddle? Can they move their hands forward? And also, importantly, can they stand up? Because if they can stand up without losing their balance, then you're on to one beautiful thing, which is the independence of the rider, and also that the horse isn't taking that stand or movement from the, uh, sorry, from the rider as something, oh, I must go forward or I must do this or I must do that. You're actually looking for the horse to realise that the rider is just changing position. They're actually not giving the horse aid. Mm -hmm. So then you, you can then, for the instructor, they can look from the side, they can look from the front, they can look from behind, and that gives you all, you know, those three different views of exactly what's happening in front of them. Yep, yep, yep. So basic distances, you know, then you're incorporating... Uh, a trot pole exercise, um, which then you're going to 1.2 metres generally, somewhere around there. Um, and once you can build on from that, you, you've got basically the world is yours. So you can change how they come at it. You can have three trot poles. You can have four trot poles. You can then start incorporating a jump, which then usually from whatever trot pole that you set, you double that distance to the cross. So in other words, if you've gone if you've gone 1.2 meters to 1.2 meters for the pole to pass, then if you go double that 2.4, and that's your trot trot trot, and then pop over the little cross. Okay, that's your basic concept of of most things. But I say so you've got so many things that you can do from that. You can do walk exercises, you can do trot exercises, and you can do counter exercises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we said, which was at the beginning, which was that that rhythm and tempo, when you're then using poles, as an instructor, you're starting to get used to what is the rhythm and tempo of jumping. So if we work on that basic concept of 3.6 metres, if we to put two poles out that are at that, you know, about 20 and a half metres, 21 metres. Yep. That, that will give us five strides in between or what we call non-jumping strides, five non-jumping strides. So if you know that should be five strides and you're getting a group to, once they're able to progress to counter, countering through those and you're counting one, two, three, four, five non-jumping strides. So we've got the landing and the takeoff. Then you go, okay, that should be pretty much a rhythm mm -hmm. of a schedule. 
and that that also makes your life much easier because the polls or the exercise gives you a nice black and white answer. You don't have to second guess it too much when you're not sure yourself if that is a good rhythm or not. The actual exercise has told you that that five, obviously we can keep improving the quality of that five, but if you're doing the five, that gives you at least a, a baseline to work from. Yep, yep, okay. And, and I'm just thinking, you know, because people will learn these exercises, you know, they can learn that, you know, put up one pole or put up the 25 metres apart or the 1.2 for trot and then build from yep. there and they're really building up a toolbox of exercises yeah. that they can teach, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, and you're yep. just really progressing with them quite slowly. You know, so some groups, you know, may, may do a lot of walking and a lot of just, you know, learning how to stand up Mm -hmm. walking through poles without the horses rushing and then being able to trot through poles while they're still standing in stirrups and also grabbing some mane or if they need a a neck strap, you know, things like that. So they can basically feel secure and the horse also understands they're not asking them to change speed. And those, those basic concepts make for green riders, green horses, and un, uh, an instructor that's just starting out in the jumping, that makes their life so much simpler. Yeah, yeah, good. Now, you talked a little bit before about variables, and you said, well, we'll talk about that later, but the variables, can you talk a bit about that? And uh, one thing I was going to ask, because you, you've given yep. us some distance there, you know, 1.2 for trot, and then double it to do your trot canter transition. But say they went on to a bounce then, what sort of stride, what sort of distance would that be? Um, so say if we've got, so we've got your trot two poles, mm-hmm. so you've got three three trot poles of 1.2, 1.2, 1.2. Yep. And then the next, that last pole to the cross will be 2.4. Yep. And then usually when you're setting up a bounce, then that is normally set around that three-metre Okay, three good. meter distance. Good. Now the other the other thing to do with that is most people will use a tape measure, and that's really important when you're first starting out. But once you can use a tape measure and you're fairly happy with that, then learning how to walk distances is actually a really important thing because it also gives you a feel of the surface. You, you're just starting to trust your instincts a little bit more. So in other words, when you're when you're starting to measure distances, one counter stride is is four steps or four strides, you know, between most trot poles is is one step plus one foot, one of your feet normally. And once you're starting to get a feeling and then a gauge, you know, your eye starts to look at those distances a set and go, okay, that looks roughly right. Mm-hmm. Those sort of things help you out a lot as well. So then then when we said, you know, that you've got slope and, and things like that. Yeah, this is the variables when the distances yeah, change so the a bit. Yeah. Come. Now, the, the wonderful thing is a lot of the time now is, in terms of surface, most surfaces that you jump on now are fairly good, mm-hmm. but we still do get the variation between grass and sand and heavier sand and things like that. But so you do have to watch where you know turns are coming from. Um, you know, if they are a little slippery or they're going into a, a slipperier section or a boggier section uh, or heavy. If you've got a heavy surface, that will make most horses work a lot harder. Um, to do distances, so you might have to shorten the distance a little bit. Obviously, we, especially with pony club kids, um, weather can play a very big role in what's going to happen next in terms of you may need to work them a little bit more, um, like so at springtime, over their trot poles, over their counter poles before they start jumping just to, to make sure we don't have too many fresh horses. Mm-hmm. Um, group sizing, um when you've got a, a big group, how you, you give yourself plenty of room to lay out an exercise um, that everyone understands where they're going to go, what's going to happen if something happens in front of them, that they circle away or they stop or whatever you've chosen to do. They're all very clear of what's going to happen if if the horse in front of them has a problem with an exercise. And they also understand that Someone else's problem is also their learning experience as well. And that's a, a fairly, once you can get the group to buy into that and to also encourage with that, um, that everyone is actually still learning, even if you're not doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look horsechats.com. Now, I know we talked in previous chats about comfort zones, your comfort zone, their comfort zone, trust, paces, 
Talk to us a little bit about comfort zones. The biggest thing with that is that you're actually spending a lot of time in the initial phase, as we said at the beginning, of working on the rider's balance. Mm -hmm. Jumping is one of those things that from the outside, if someone's holding what you call a two-point position, in other words, where it's just two points of contact with yep. the, the, your two legs and your seat out of the saddle, that looks from the outside really easy. It's one of those things, <laughs> yes. you know, where you see when you're watching the Olympics and you go, you know, someone doing gymnastics or something, and go, I don't know why they didn't do that movement. That looks so easy. Yes. And yet it's actually extremely tiring. It's, mm -hmm. It takes quite a little bit of endurance to get used to. It takes quite a bit of timing with your thought process and biomechanically to get used to doing. And it also takes a little confidence to stand there and hold your balance independently of the horse. So that trusting is that first part where they also then trust themselves, the riders, but they also then trust their horses. They know what the horse is going to do when they change that position. They also know that the rider and the horse still have a connection through their legs, whereas a lot of riders will have done a, a lot of the connection with their seat. So when you're taking that seat out of the equation, then the legs, your voice, and those things have to, to actually fill that void. Um, so that's sort of where the trust comes from. And also that you're, you're not going to... You know, if you're actually having quite an honest conversation with your students that says that, you know, if you have a problem with something that we're setting up, please tell me in advance. Don't tell me when you're lying on the ground in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's quite okay to be nervous. It's quite okay to be unsure. If you are, come and ask me. We'll talk about, it. you know, why you're feeling that way or if you're unsure or if you want to just watch a few go through, that's, that's all fine. Um, you don't feel that once you've done something that if they don't do it that's because sometimes people feel it's a you know they're questioning your integrity by not doing it yeah. where it's not that at all it's actually that they're they are generally nervous or they're generally unsure or mm. or whatever the case may be. or you might find out that you know three weeks ago oh, by the way i didn't tell you at this beginning but i had a really bad fall doing that you know so you sometimes find out as you're going along what people's things and feels are whereas when you ask at the beginning, oh, no, everyone's right, everyone's ready to go, everyone's feeling confident, okay, fair enough, let's go. Um, so, yes, that's always an important part of that conversation at the beginning to, to let that let that gate open that they are quite safe to come and ask you, I'm unsure or I'm nervous or I'm not sure if I want to do this. Okay. Um, and that doesn't mean it, it won't happen, um, but it's then, a, okay, how we look at doing this or or what do we need to improve, or where do you feel you're losing that confidence? And that's just a nice, honest, open dialogue. Okay. Now, if you do have a group, you know, you've got a group, you've taught them last week, you've warmed them up, you've said, right, we're ready to do this. If we need to stop that group and lower the exercise, I mean, is this, this set in stone? You know, tell us a little bit about that, because I'm sure there's going to be times where someone doesn't tell you, oh, sorry, my horse you know, had a fall during the week or my horse yep. got, there might be a bit of a problem they haven't told you about before. So the horse is stopping, the ride is overwhelmed. What happens there if you do need to stop the group, lower the exercises? What can happen there? Uh, the beautiful thing about show jumping courses, show jumping exercises, is you can literally change a, a course and an obstacle fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even have the best intentions of all the world where uh, – you know, horses might have gone through two, three, four times and then had a stumble. And, you know, for whatever reason, that stumble or that trip or that knock of rail caused, uh, you know, that momentary mm -hmm. hiccup, I'm yes. not sure now. Yep. Um, and, and sometimes it's reassuring them that's okay, give it another go, let's be a bit more reassuring with our leg or our voice or whatever. Or it can be the simple fact, I'm going to take that back rail off that boxer, I want you to try again now or you know it's it's very much it's, you did see you used to see a lot of cor uh, courses a lot of coaches that felt that it was a personal you know slight for them if the riders didn't trust them and that's mm -hmm. that's actually not the case at all it's like anything confidence isn't something that just sets in stone and, and is there all the time um so and you also as we said two point is very fatiguing you will get people that are actually starting to fatigue, and of course that affects their confidence as well. Okay, 
So lowering exercises or, and as a, as I said in those notes, the um, what you can often find with, it, especially as a, a new instructor jumping, when you have a, a big group of horses that are in front of you doing an exercise, that can look quite confronting. Like you've got these horses going past and past and past and past. And it, sometimes you, you do need to just get one or two to walk or the whole group and then mm-hmm. and mix it up so you, you have that time to, to think and to respond. Um, whereas when you just have them all on the move at the same time all the time, yep. that's very like that takes a lot of concentration and mm-hmm. a lot of peripheral vision and a lot of good positioning from you all the time to be able to see all that group all the time in motion and see anyone that you think, oh, this is, thank you, I'm a little unstuck. Yep. I need to rescue this situation before it gets any further. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just thinking about nervous riders and horses, what are we looking for? Yep. Because some people are going to be embarrassed. You know, you've already said if, if they are nervous, they've been going well and, you know, and the jumps are getting up a little bit higher than what they've ever done or they've seen someone else had a fall and all of a sudden they're nervous or the horse, there's a reason for the horse to be nervous. Tell us a little bit about that and what we as a coach should be doing if that happens. The two things that leap to mind with this one is if you're teaching cross country and, yeah. you know, you, you often have all the best intentions in the world, all the horses seem to be fine, they've warmed up, they've jumped and jumps. The first rider comes into the first sort of decent jump that you've done, something happens and they have a fall. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be, you know, with horses, it can be just one, literally one of those moments in time that could have gone one way or the other way. And But suddenly the whole group's gone, oh, it, and they all sit back and go, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do jumping now. Um, and so dealing with that and just putting it in context, okay, let's maybe start over here, let's you know, move to this fence or, or you know, what's what's the engine that we need? What's the position that she, he, she should have had? What's the line? You know, try and break down what the problem was. Um, and then the other thing that you often see with those people that will come, and this, is, this will happen, especially in Panicot, this will happen a lot where, They'll come to you and they oh, last week or two weeks ago, I jumped huge and I was doing amazing, blah, 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 and it was so fantastic. And then, but what's sometimes happened is the horses sat with it for two weeks and going, yeah, you know what? I wasn't so keen on jumping those big heads. I wasn't mm-hmm. so keen on stretching out. I I maybe actually hurt myself a little bit stretching that yep. much. Yep. And suddenly the horse that they were riding two weeks ago that was big and brave suddenly is, oh, I'm not so sure. Yep. Um, you know, so you you often come across that, and then the the riders feeling obviously, understandably, fairly dejected, and you just get them to understand this. There's plenty of times in jumping where even really good horse and rider combinations will not necessarily go all the way back, but they'll go back to a, to a good solid base level and work their way back up again. And that's exactly the same for them. They'll go back, maybe do those trot poles again, maybe do those counter poles again. Um, you know, maybe do little gymnastic exercise where they're doing just a series of bounces or, or things like that, where they're just they're getting either the horse and or rider basically back in motion, the muscle twitch happening faster again, the thought process going from, well, if I start the exercise, I've got to finish the exercise. Um, so in other words, the horse isn't thinking option C is not to jump anything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fine. It's find a way to get through the exercise. Mm-hmm. So even if you're lowering the jumps and lowering your expectations as a coach, you're actually building the confidence and that's going to get them further anyway. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Because you, you often have with jumping, you know, for you you can see progression, you go, okay, that's understandable, this is progressing this way. But sometimes um, when it goes the other way, sometimes it's not always as obvious as you think. You know, you think, mm. oh, they had three or four rails that time, maybe that made them a little shaky. But sometimes it actually comes from, when something's gone really well, but what they haven't realised is, you know, everyone was a little overstretched. There was a lot of adrenaline happening in that moment and when you've taken all that adrenaline away from that moment and the horse and, and or rider are now feeling oh, a little vulnerable. Yes, that was exciting at that time, but can I replicate it? Yeah. Um, and so you do have that a little bit. And also you you do have those other kids that go, do I want to replicate it? Like, am I putting, like, I've, I've got this glorious moment in my mind, you know, what if it all goes wrong now? Um, you know, so they're almost self-sabotaging 
you know, laying the foundation again. And that that's fine. Like you just get them to understand that's okay. We just pick ourselves up. This is how we learn resilience. We learn from picking ourselves back up, starting again, um, getting those basics right. All those things come from those basics um, and then we work up again from there. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Now, I know this next point becomes a bit of a problem, as particularly with competitive coaches, you know, that they get their ambitions yep. and goals mixed up with their students. So they might nominate their student for something that they would ride on their horse. They might buy a horse that they would like, not necessarily one that's a student. What can we do about that, about coaches getting their goals mixed up or ambitions mixed up with the students? That, that's a very, you've got to be a very honest conversation with yourself in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, when someone is coming, I, I just want to learn, like, especially if they that you can already see they're on a, a very nice jumping horse or a very simple horse. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, or you often see uh, um, where a horse goes, I wish I had that, I wish I had that horse that I imagine what I could have done. Um where it, it still it still comes back to what does the rider want to do. like if it, it is just their enjoyment it's just their freedom or is, uh, I'm, I want to you know get to this base and then and then they might want to get to the next base but if you if you project them you know all the way forward straight away this is the championships we want to get to let's make it happen go 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 you know. As they always say, you know, if you only focus on the destination, the journey becomes a series of of road hills, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you you actually want it to let them. You obviously encourage them and and get them to understand what's good, what's not, what's what is capable realistically, what's a nice dream to have, you know, and it's perfectly okay to work towards a dream. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to be grounded in in what do they want and what are they capable of doing in okay. in now. Like yes, okay. yes, work forward, work for improvement. But what are they capable of doing right now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, this sphere of influence, communication. Can you talk a little bit about jumping done in open, larger spaces, getting used to that environment? Yes, you you often you know coming into a fairly large you know. You know, paddock or or yep. arena, mm-hmm. and that's often confronting in itself for for most coaches um, that are used to being up close or up close and personal with with their their students. Um, and so it's understanding how you give how you give information. Like if you want to give quite a series of information, they've got to be close to you and often still, mm-hmm. so they can absorb it. Um, once they're on the move. You know, you can only throw your voice in terms of technical information. You can only throw your voice technically for about twenty meters, thirty meters. The most they'll get technical. You can, you know, do loud commands. You know, further than that. But in terms of you're trying to give them technical information, you've only got probably when they're about within twenty meters of you. You know, thirty meters. Otherwise, what you're then doing is you're literally talking to yourself. Um, it sounds good that you've given this information, but no one could hear you. Mm-hmm. And the other thing with that is if anyone is nervous, and you probably notice this yourself, if, if someone is nervous, one of the first things they will always say to you, I can't hear you, yes. I can't hear you, yes. can't. And that's a fairly good indication that actually someone is either quite nervous or starting to be overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes it's the other way where their their focus is becoming so narrow that may be a good thing, but it possibly isn't um, where they actually are shutting out outside things. And so, and sometimes we do need that narrow focus, but if you're talking in a training situation, obviously that's not necessarily the, the world's great thing. Yeah. Um, so it, it's understanding that as the coach, you've done the groundwork and set up the exercise and you've got them to understand what's required of this exercise before you send them out because if you're trying to do a lot of coaching while they're on the move in a in a hugely technical way, they're just not close enough. They won't be able to hear you, they won't be able to understand it, and they won't be able to incorporate it that quickly. You can give commands if you want them to stop or turn left or turn right, 
um, or little things that you know you've already triggered for them. If I say this, I want you to do that. Um, but if you're trying to give a series of technical information while they're on the move, you, you're basically talking to the air. Mm-hmm. So that's where you've got to be confident in how much of a foundation they have so that they can safely go away from you and be able to enact that without you necessarily being able to talk them through it all the time. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, now jumping, you know, we know it's a confidence sport, but how are we going to embrace fear, challenges and uncertainty? That is the great question of jumping. (laughs) (laughs) And we've come to an expert, you know, not just World Cup show jumping, but, you know, you really get into this fixing um, or, you know, fixing people yeah. and, and helping yeah, the them with their yeah, anxiety, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, this section actually is, is very much, as we said, be like are you projecting your own thoughts? Like so, mm-hmm. so say for someone, uh, you know, trotting over some trot poles is, is their Olympic Games. Like, yep. And that's yep. what you, you know, what doesn't seem a challenge to me or to someone else is, you know, you, you've just created the Nations Cup of, you know, of trot poles. Yes. Um, and and so understanding where someone's fear is coming from, whether it's control, whether it's, um, you know, their loss of balance, whether it's um, they're just, which is often the case, they're just uncertain of what's going to, how this is going to play out. Um, and that's where you're being very open in your communication and very understanding in your communication that there is, always going to be a certain level of fear. We talked in an earlier episode about that, that there are very, very, very few people that don't have fear. Most of the time, fear is is actually quite beneficial to us, but it's then being able to operate while we feel the fear um, mm-hmm. and getting them to understand why you're doing this, what do you want to get out of it, um, exploring their horizons and opening up those things that, you know, we all hopefully live in a world that we want to actually, you know, open the environment, open the envelope around us and not let that envelope come closed in around us. Mm -hmm. Um, So that you're setting a good foundation, you're doing things, this is what we want from this exercise. It may look complicated, but this is, if you break this down, in other words, a series of gymnastic exercises looks very complicated, but if you break it down into it's just a, a nice rhythmical trot on the way in, then we come up into our jumping position, we actually just hold our straight line, we allow the horse to do its job, which is jump, they're going to land hopefully in canter, because that's what we've asked for, they counter two strides, they jump the next fence, they counter another stride, they do the next fence, and that you're just reassuring them that that's it's actually broken down into small small simple tasks throughout that exercise and you're moving through that exercise and you're then coming out the other side beautiful yeah we're very well explained now ben the last point have fun stay safe how often do you have to say that (laughs) Uh, i think with anything like when you're when you're doing something new you you can sometimes either get you know, as a coach, you, you can get a little intense mm-hmm. or you can, you know, get a little single, tr- you know, one mind track, you know, this is how it's got to be. Um, and you forget to embrace the moment of you're outside working with horses, working with kids, um, you know, you're letting them do like this is possibly working on some of their dreams, some of their hopes. Um, you know, you're, you're out there really living a joy with them. Um, and it doesn't get much cooler than that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't get much cooler as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's often just taking that moment back and just, you know, just seeing it for that that wonderful picture that it is. Mm. You know, you, you get to be outside, you get to be with horses, you get to be, you know, working with athletes that are, that are often wanting to, to expand what they're doing, even if, even if it's just – Literally, like sometimes the most exciting thing is watching someone walk over a plank for the first time um, and they're going, oh, my God, I'm not sure if this is possible. And they've walked over it. And by the end of the lesson, they're trotting over it, yep. you know, and they might even be carrying it. Whereas they, when, you, <laughs> when you first talked about putting that plank up, you know, they were anything but thinking this is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's it's always pretty cool when that happens. Um, whereas when you're first talking to them about it, you can see, you know, they, they are, let's say, quite unsure. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you can show them that foundation, 
show them that it comes down to a straight line. The horse is trusting, you know, they've kept their balance. They're going to secure their balance either with a, you know, with the mane or a neck strap or something like that. Um, if they can get the horse to go straight, that means they're going to land straight. So it doesn't matter if the horse does quite a big jump. If that, if the horse lands straight, that makes their balance issues much easier to deal with. Yeah. Um, and, and you've just been in that moment where they've exhilarated something that was they thought was quite beyond what they could do 10 minutes ago mm-hmm. or half an hour ago. I think lots and lots of information there for, for coaches and particularly someone who yeah, is coming in and um, the coaching is a bit of a challenge. This is going to help people get over it, you know, just coming in from someone with so much experience like Ben to give you lots and lots of ideas and to go into later on a bit more depth maybe. But I think it's been a really good overview of, um, you know, taking on the challenge of, of coaching jump training, Ben. So thank you. Thank you for your time today. But now if people would like to go into this in a bit more detail, what's the best way to contact you? Um, so just my email address mm-hmm. and my phone number. Yep. You can text. That's probably sometimes the easiest way to get me is by texting. Uh, the other thing I also would encourage, um, you know, for coaches just starting out is if they do, uh, if they just attend a course designers um, course. Oh, so that they've got a good understanding. So, yeah, yeah, a good so understanding of the course well. design. Yeah, yeah good, that, good. That, you know, makes everything so much clearer as well. And mm-hmm. that, once again, they can work with distances then. They get to understand distances and they can just, you know, watch and submerse themselves in, um, you know, the thinking of, of what people are doing with, with distances and why they're doing them. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they don't understand it totally at that stage, it, it sort of gives them that base, you know, to work from. Yep. Yeah, perfect. All right. So thank you, Ben. I'm um, looking forward to okay. having you back again. And, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Bernice. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.